Common Editor at The Telegraph, Annabelle Denham. Welcome, Annabelle. Thank you for having me, Kevin. I feel very honoured. Well, uh, I'm honoured to have you. You know, I said, if we're going to launch this new series, there's only one person who's going to uh, be my first guest. That's Annabelle Denham. So let's go. Uh, first off, uh, there's a lot of stuff we're going to get through, uh, but uh, this is a very big week for Rishi Sunak, isn't it? I mean, he has... Ma we're going to talk about some of the massive mounting problems he has in his entry. Uh, but, of course, we're leading towards the three by-elections on uh, Thursday, which will indicate just where he stands in terms of public opinion. Uh, we don't want to uh, preempt whatever the results of those elections will be. But... Uh, Things are bad for Sunak, aren't they? They're pretty bad. I think you know that they're bad when the idea that they may get one in three, they may win one in three of these by-elections, will be greeted by the Conservative Party with a sigh of relief, of course. Let's not forget that in 2019, they secured an 80-seat majority. Now, in the intervening period, that's been whittled down to a 60-seat working majority. The chances are uh, that it's going to be even smaller by Friday of this week. It's certainly not looking good. Um, it's possible that they'll hold on to one of those seats. Uh, in fact, I think it may be likely that the Lib Dems, Labour and the Tories get one seat each. What will be really interesting is what happens in Uxbridge. Now, there's an expectation that the Tories won't be able to hold it. But if they've managed, as they, as they have tried, to make it an effective referendum on ULES, then it is possible that they could storm to victory. So I think that's really the seat to watch. Yes, indeed. And of course, that's Boris Johnson's old seat so uh, uh, the focus of attention will be on that constituency uh, let's talk about uh, some of the other issues dominating the headlines today and I think the main one because I'm getting more and more concerned about this mounting hysteria about climate change so what we have here Annabelle right now in Britain is a very unusually cold July we're being told it will remain uh, relatively freezing and pouring with rain until the middle of of August. So it's as if the people that want us to be terrified about climate change say, well, it's not going to work in Britain. Uh, hang on a second. It's really hot in Rome. Let's say it's hot in Rome. So we're being told about these searing temperatures in Rome, in Turkey, in Greece. And this morning, I actually heard on the news on Talk TV that apparently it's very hot in Arizona. Arizona is a desert. What do they expect? Uh, so, I mean, it seems to me there's a parallel universe between what we're experiencing, I'm looking out at a pretty grim, cold day, and what we're being told to be terrified about. So if you can't find an alarming temperature at home, head abroad. So you get all these TV reporters, you know, going round Rome with suspicious sweating faces, probably had it sprayed onto them beforehand, before they hit the airwaves. Uh, but, I mean, what next? We're going to go to the Sahara? I mean, do you see what I'm saying? It's as if there's an orthodoxy. We're being ordered to be terrified about climate change. And there are those of us who I accept there is climate change, but I'm not entirely convinced because there's no evidence that mankind can do much about it. And yet it is now pervasive. You have to be terrified about climate change and all the television channels are going to come up with ways to terrify you. I think this is getting out of control. It certainly seems that way. I feel as though there's now this palpable sense of almost excitement among the eco-fanatics when they see that the mercury is soaring somewhere in the world and they can get all of the media sort of, you know, or some of the media at least, uh, focused on that particular area in the world where uh, temperatures are getting very high, perhaps even at the highest uh, on record. I mean, it's certainly true that global temperatures are rising, but this idea that we're experiencing some kind of mad and inferno of persistent temperatures that have never been experienced before on earth is is frankly you know ridiculous now of course you know as i say of course we don't want global warming um but this at the moment is really just playing into just stop oil's hands it's that idea that we're all 
sinners. We're responsible for the fact that uh, global temperatures are rising, that we've you know, caused all of these issues um, with our ecosystems across the planet. And, and most importantly, I think, this idea that we're not doing anything about it, that people don't care. Well, of course they do. They care emphatically. We're making massive changes already to the way that we live our lives. We've got this arbitrary net zero by 2050 target that the government is trying to enforce on us with unpopular measures like ULES, like electric vehicles, which are throwing up all sorts of problems, not least the fact that we haven't got the infrastructure for them, uh, like heat pumps, like hydrogen trials in certain villages that are trying to revolt uh, against them. But nonetheless, this is absolutely something that we're taking seriously. What we have issue with is the idea that the solution needs to be centrally planned and forced on us by government rather than allowing some kind of market discovery process where entrepreneurs and technological innovators find solutions, solutions that are actually appealing to members of the public that are affordable mm -hmm. and we pursue those. So I think, you know, this is completely playing into the hands of uh, the eco fanatics and, you know, we, we really need to calm down. Yes, indeed. And, uh, you know, there are 14 different Just Stop Oil demonstrations going on today, blocking roads all over South London, ruining people's days. Uh, and uh, I can never get it through my head why Just Stop Oil don't go to the Chinese embassy and say, please, could you stop emitting 28% of the world's uh, ca carbon emissions, uh, whereas they focus all their fury and their ire on us, the British, who produce less than 1% of the world's carbon emissions. There's something kind of weird about this that is all wrong, and I think it is terrifying people unnecessarily.